Welcome back to Scotch and a Beer, you legends, you. Thank you so much for sticking with this story and putting up with me as I don't make uploads. I know that that's frustrating and you just want to see what freaking happens, but life gets in the way a lot for me. Like as we speak right now, I'm coming to you from my wife's mother's cabin in Brandov in the Czech Republic, which is about an hour north of Prague. Same place in one of my other episodes where that Brewster wouldn't let me do the goddamn video. In the last episode, I had just left off of the 2014 edition of the Formula Drift season, and we were headed to Atlanta. Now, I had just spent $6,000 that I definitely did not have, and lost 50% of my team, and had to tap the resources of my buddy Andy to help me drive everything out there because Jesse and Aoki weren't able to go. Otherwise, that would have left me with a 40-something hour drive to do by myself. So big thanks to Andy Barrow for stepping up and taking the long haul with me. But first, a scotch and a beer. Now, Michaela's mom was nice enough to get me this little gift set for my birthday. And it is the Tom and Tool 10, the 16, and the 21 year. So these are perfect. They're bigger than shooters. So it's an actual full, probably two fingers, full two fingers of scotch. And I didn't have to buy three full-size things for the episodes that I'm going to release while I'm here. That's awesome. I'm going to start with the 10. Now, this is the Speyside Glenlivet, which is weird because Glenlivet's a Highland, obviously, but uh, they have a Speyside version called the Tom and Tool, and hopefully it tastes different and or better. Now, for the beer, I'm going with the Lobkowicz Pschenisch. Pschenisch. I don't know how to say that correctly, but it is a... Wheat beer, and wheat beers are super new to the Czech Republic, and there's only three. I just got corrected on my spelling. It's Lokovica Prishitne, Prishitne, or something. Anyway, let's give it a try. Oh, got a bubble. Pull that off. That was wrong. And for some reason, to me, beer always tastes better out of a fancy ass glass with a gold rim. So thanks, Stella. It's good. It's a little bit lacking in the flavor department, but. For a couple of first attempts at a wheat beer in the Czech Republic, I will definitely take it because wheat beers are obviously my favorite. Now, let's move on to the Tom and Tool 10 year. And that is a full gracious two fingers of delicious, wonderful beverage. Man, first smell that comes to mind is Mr. Clean. I, I don't know why. Kind of smells like a cleaning product, which worries me that it's going to be super, super alcoholy. Uh, but we're going to give it the old college try. Okay, so that's way better than I thought it was going to be. It's still, it's still pretty young compared to some of the scotches that I've had in the past on this show. But it's decent, and it's really kind of hard to put a finger on what it actually tastes like. It's like heavy, heavy, heavy grapes. A little bit earthy, but not like peat, but more like just dirt. It's an interesting one, and I shall enjoy it during the course of this show. Now, rewinding just a little bit, and going back to the fact that I no longer had a crew chief. Now, along with a bunch of other stuff that this kind of skipped me out on, self-inducedly, I would now not have tools to work on the car. I had a very, very basic set of tools. It was like that Craftsman plastic box with the plastic drawers, and that had gotten stolen with my truck 
and everything else that I had for drifting a while back. So I had a very, very, very crappy limited set of tools to go with. I know I had a jack. I didn't have any power tools. That would have just been embarrassing and it wouldn't have worked very well for Formula Drift competition. Like, hey dudes, can I borrow your everything? So like any wise man that's been stuck in between a rock and or a hard place, I busted out the old credit card and I headed over to Harbor Freight. And the reason why I went with Harbor Freight is twofold. First one being if I lost a tool and or if somebody borrowed a tool and didn't get it back, which would end up happening a lot, I wouldn't really care if one was missing. I could just go buy, pay $9.99 and get another one. Cool. Okay, reason number two. If I would have bought real tools, I would have got one electric impact for my entire tool set worth at Harbor Freight. So I ran down the aisles of Harbor Freight like one of those old shopping shows, just kind of shoveling stuff into the basket. Uh, used every single coupon and discount that I could possibly find. Ended up filling up like three shopping carts plus a toolbox and a generator. And I think I ended up getting out of there like 1800 bucks for a fully stocked tool cabinet. It's getting better. It's definitely getting better. So walking out with one of the longest receipts I think I'd ever seen in my entire life, I was now semi more prepared for what was going to happen to me in Atlanta. And as you remember, I picked up a trailer right before we left and about two days before we were supposed to leave, we went over to Aoki's house. His dad had a bunch of old signposts laying around that was meant to go to the scrapper and we decided to make tire racks out of it. So we hobbled together some stuff, spent like $22 in hardware at Lowe's because Harbor Freight didn't have what I needed and we put an impromptu tire system in that would carry 10 tires per side. So I was able to put 20 wheels and or tires inside up above everything secured that wouldn't fall out. Sick. So off Andy and I went with a semi-filled trailer full of a car that semi-worked with a semi-team. We were just half of everything that we needed to be. That's okay. We're still gonna push on. Instead of moving forward and actually talking about Atlanta, I'm gonna rewind just a little bit further because there was kind of a ridiculous story that goes along with Formula D Atlanta that kind of ran previous to and beside on complete accident and it's a little bit ridiculous, so I'm gonna get into that right now. I'm also gonna call some people out for being really stupid and shitty. Anywho, back in, I would say, 2010 or 2011, a new shop had opened up in Albuquerque owned by this dude named Josh called Emphasis Motorsports, and they were supposed to be RV-centric, Jay-Z-centric, super import-friendly shop in town that that's all they were supposed to do. So I was like, sick, finally somebody that deals with RBs. That's awesome, I can get parts, I can work on this thing, I can do upgrades. So started talking to them, they were interested in the program, and I ended up having them put a motor together for me. I want to preface with the fact that I had never prepositioned emphasis for Formula D or to be involved with them or to have sponsorship from them in any other way other than the Pro-Am stuff that I was doing. So this, keep in mind, is all on the black Pro-Am car that was in Motorcycle vs. Car Drift Battle 3. Cool. I mean, I had Motiva stickers on the car and I was super loyal to Motiva. Well, Scotty and Dave more than Motiva because there was this dude junior there at the time that was a whole different issue. But I'm pretty sure he's in jail now. But anyway, so I had recently lost the motor, as you know, filming Motorcycle vs. Car Drift Battle 3. I actually rod knocked the motor at the end of that video, so I needed a short block. So I contacted Emphasis. Emphasis had their grubby mitts on a short block. So I went, I paid the man, I got a receipt for I think 500 US dollars for that. And they said, hey, if we can put some stickers around the engine bay, we'll put everything together for you. We'll throw in an intake manifold and we'll call it good. And I was like, sick, perfect, because I am a broke ass. 
So they got everything together. They fabbed me up this Power V. Called it a Power V just because it probably robbed so much power, but it was basically a 90 out of the intercooler down and it V'd at the bottom, was welded up, and then it went up to the intake manifold because it had to go around the intake. Uh, so we called that the Power V. I'm sure that was good for 15 or 20 horsepower loss. Uh, but we got the motor together and there was this big car show at the Balloon Fiesta Park, which is right down the street from my house. So I was like, well, cool, I'll just street drive the drift car down there, do this, hand out flyers for whatever year's season that was gonna be, um, sling some whiskey garage stuff, and just drive it back home. Cool, it'll be awesome. Nice time to get everything broken in. And as I was leaving Desert Fest, I pulled up to the stoplight to get onto the freeway and made it about halfway up the ramp car died and I wasn't speeding or getting on it or anything and the car died and I kind of rolled over to the side pulled over on the freeway and opened the hood was completely broken down so strangely enough these guys with like thousand horsepower Supras had come down from a different state and they were nice enough to actually take their like $80,000 Supra out of this trailer. Let me put my piece of shit 240SX in there. And they actually drove me home and followed behind with this crazy show Supra and dropped me off at my house, gave the dudes high fives and some whiskey garage stuff. So it just goes to show that not all Supra guys are douchebags. Those were some of the nicest dudes that I'd ever met and it just helped a random guy on the side of the freeway, which was really, really awesome. So thanks dudes for that. Of course I brought it back to emphasis after only having it be running for one day. God. And after they took the motor apart, they determined that it had snapped a cam, which would come back to haunt me for the rest of my RB life, apparently. Now I wasn't super, super popular at this time in the drift world, but I had enough clout to possibly give that shop some bad press if I was to complain about them publicly. So they made it right after some arguing about whose fault it was, not that it mattered. He did make it right, but it took weeks to get the thing back up and running again. So I missed a couple of local events that I was running and needed the practice because I was still running Pro-Am at this point. But anyway, he fixed it. Pro-Am car is running again. Power V is still installed and there's an emphasis sticker on the intake manifold. Cool. Now, my original goal was to keep the Pro-Am car completely running, completely on its own, never take any parts off of it, and use it as a backup car, a buddy car, a party car, uh, just to have a separate drift car from the FD car so I could actually get some seat time in because I was always scared to drive the FD car. I didn't even want to pull it off the trailer. Now fast forward to 2014 when we had to rob the motor out of the Pro-Am car and put it in the FD car because we didn't get the stroker done in time, there were delays, then Long Beach happened and I lost my crew chief who was in charge of doing all that stuff and the snowball effect had run into that dead on so we had to take the Pro-Am motor out and mix it with all the parts and stuff that I had for the Pro car. So now the Pro-Am motor is in my Formula D car. We'd done Long Beach and we were headed to Atlanta. Again, keep in mind, I had not propositioned emphasis for sponsorship in Formula D. I was fully on with Motiva at this time. And I'll get back to this story kind of after we get our pits set up in Atlanta. So Andy and I set off, we cross the country, we end up intermingling with a couple of other FD drivers, I think Jeff Jones and Matt Field. We drove with Matt Field a bunch on the way there and then we ended up splitting up and then getting back together. And so we get to Atlanta early, early, early on Wednesday morning and I had been talking to some Atlanta dudes and somebody referred me to Andy Sapp and Andy Sapp is one of the raddest dudes on the planet. So Andy said, oh, take it to my dudes over at Gran Turismo East, they'll sort it out. They'll let you know if they find any problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, sick, thank God. So we got there around 10 a.m. and it, the car was on the alignment rack for like four and a half hours. And they couldn't find anything that was completely out of whack. Uh, put a basic S13 drift spec alignment on it and off we went. Did a celebratory burnout, put it back in the trailer and headed straight to Road Atlanta.
So we hit the pits, and as luck would have it, and unbeknownst to me, they put you in by ranking, so apparently we weren't doing very well. I was pit next to Danny George, which was awesome because that kind of made it feel like home since I had spent the entire previous season with those dudes. Now there's always the fact that they put dudes that they really don't like at the very end of the pits no matter what your rank is, uh, but that's again a different story altogether. So you get to the pits blind on your paid practice Thursday and you walk around the pits until you find your name spray painted on the ground somewhere and then that is your home for the weekend. So we get the tent set up, we get the merch ready to go, we get the generator fired up for the first time ever since we had just bought it at Harbor Freight. Plot twist, it worked. We got the car cleaned, then we lowered the tents and strapped everything down to it to be ready for paid practice on Thursday. Now here's where things got a little bit weird, and this goes right back to that emphasis story that I was talking about earlier. Now, we finally kind of settled down, we were kind of figuring out what plans we wanted to do for dinner, how we needed to get to the hotel to check in, etc, 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 and Aoki comes up to me with these rather large stickers in his hand. And I'm like, what are you doing with some big stickers, dude? And I mean, these are like door covering, like title sponsor stickers like they're really long because emphasis motorsports is a long name and to have that be this tall means it's like i don't know six feet seven feet long now aoki hands them to me and is like josh gave these to me to give to you here with these words only give these to dan he'll know what to do what I'm so confused at this point, I don't even know what to do with my hands. So now this guy, whom I never propositioned, didn't send a proposal to, didn't want to be involved because of the crappy experience I'd had with him earlier, has now basically sent somebody to Formula D Atlanta with a veiled threat to put these stickers on the car or else. Like, what the actual fuck? Like... Are, is, are these people even real? I mean, who actually does this shit? Now, I guess his reasoning was is because he thought the Pro-Am motor was his motor. I had paid for, and again, had the receipt for the motor that I had bought. For him to do the labor and to put the stickers on the intake manifold, that was his deal. Not his motor at all. My motor, bought and paid for. Now, I understand that it did have the emphasis stickers on the intake manifold, and I left those on the intake manifold. So those were still there. I just had no reason to put any other emphasis stickers on the car because they weren't sponsoring my foray into Formula D. Had it been a fully built free motor that they were now supporting and sending somebody out to deal with at the events, sure, I'd run a gigantic ass sticker on the car. But a stock bottom end that I paid for? Go fuck yourself. So I did the right thing and tossed the stickers straight into a trash can. Anyways, that's enough about that. I'll kind of circle back in the next episode about what happened after we got back from Atlanta, which had to do with lawsuits and... Uh, it's fucking stupid. So Atlanta had always been my favorite track to watch. Like, being there and being Danny George's spotter, being up close and personal to everything, seeing the footage from it and keep drifting fun... Just watching FD on the live stream in general, it was my favorite track and I wanted nothing more than to thrash down that hill, chuck it in as hard as I could, and let it all hang out for the rest of the track. Super wide open, elevation change, gear changes, like it's just everything that you want a track to be in drifting. And to me, it seemed like the most fun track to do. And I was super, super pumped to do it, but I was a little apprehensive because I had a car that didn't turn. So we wake up bright and early for paid practice on Thursday, and I keep saying paid practice. Long Beach doesn't have paid practice. In Formula D, in Pro 1, and I believe Pro 2 now, you don't get an extra day of practice. You pay for the extra day of practice. So if you want to practice on Thursday, I believe it was $500 to do paid practice on Thursday. Then on top of your $1,200 or whatever it is to actually enter the race itself. Now, if you do not take the paid practice, you will probably get two laps in before practice is over because this is at the point when there was like 70 drivers in FD and there was no time in the two hour window that you had for practice before the actual event that you would get the track dialed. 
and actually begin to work on your line. Now, all of the guys that have driven these tracks previously obviously have a huge advantage and they can just dial their stuff in on Thursday, take minimal laps on Friday, then go straight into qualifying. If it's your rookie year, if it's your first time driving it, that is a huge hindrance. So you have to take the paid practice. Like there's just no way around it. We wake up bright and early for paid practice on Thursday. We head to the track all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, hoping that the alignment at Gran Turismo East would have fixed the issues that we were having and we could just shred for the first time at the second event of Formula B 2014. And me being me, that would absolutely not be the case. So first things first, we raise the tents up, we get everything set, we put the tables out, we clean it once again because it rained that night, and dead battery. First thing, second event of Formula D, car doesn't start. Now, in Formula D, if your battery's dead at the line, you automatically forfeit whatever it was you were doing. If you're in practice, you get pushed off to the side and you have to go back to the pits and fix everything. If you were in qualifying, you just lost your qualifying run. If you're in competition, you just lost your competition run. So dead batteries are kind of a big deal and it has taken its fair share of people out of competition. I'm not the first and I won't be the last, but to start your day off like that was kind of a, a bum deal. So we borrow a jump box because that's the one thing I didn't get. We start the car, we let it warm up, and I head out to do my first laps at Road Atlanta. Now, I go out to do my warm up donuts and something feels even worse with the steering than had ever felt before. Something had manifested itself during the alignment that wasn't present before. Maybe something was just crooked enough to work and it was just locking. Like I couldn't steer more than this far in either direction. It was, it was unbelievable. Like I said, I had the only S chassis that couldn't freaking steer. It was also at this point that I watched Tony Angelo almost total his car doing warm-up donuts, smashing into the wall back there. And I love Tony Angelo and I actually gave him a coilover of mine to, to fix because his was bent. Um, but yeah, so that had just happened and I was in a bad mood already because I couldn't steer the car. And so we line up and I go out for my first run. And so I head over, I get in line and I'm like, well, I'm just gonna fucking do it and make this happen. Now, as I'm sitting in line, it starts to pour freaking rain. Now I don't have any windows or window coverings or anything. So the rain is just dumping into my lap it's not cold, but it still sucks being wet in a driving suit. So I blast down the straight, first, second, third, fourth. I initiate, spin. I don't hit the wall and I didn't hit the kitty litter. So I consider that a win and good freaking start, Dan. Your first ever run at Formula D Atlanta and you spin out on your first lap. <sighs> Sick. So I get back in line, I'm a little bit shaky, the nerves are still there, I, uh, I just hate the car at this point. It turns out it was way more slippery than I thought it was going to be. So the second lap, I chuck it in and I reel the angle back to about four degrees where I'm just barely, I'm on the e-brake but I'm just counter steered like this much and I'm just holding, 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 kind of rotate, back on throttle, and actually make it to transition up around the hill. Again, going to almost full lock, which is like right here. So I'm sitting here going up the hill at like four degrees of angle. And this is when you went all the way up to the top around the keyhole, back down and around. So I make it all the way up, kind of straighten at the top because I can't get the car to transition back over, make it down through the keyhole. I'm going back down, I'm going back down, I'm going back down. And as I'm transitioning to go back up the hill, I lock and then it's stuck again and I loop again and almost hit the wall and it freaks me the fuck out. <sighs> didn't hit the wall. Went into the grass, didn't hit the wall. Got super, super, super lucky. I'm like, oh my God, I can't complete a lap. now. Big, big, big rule of thumb in Pro-Am drifting and Formula D drifting, and I've probably mentioned this before. If you cannot complete a new course within two laps, that's getting the feel on one and then dialing it in the second lap, you shouldn't be doing Pro-Am and you shouldn't be doing Formula D. Period. 
Like you don't have the skills. And here I was breaking my own rules. I'd like to say that it wasn't my fault, but it is my fault because the mistakes that were on the car are manifesting towards what I'm trying to do with the car. And because I don't know enough about suspension dynamics, I don't know what to do to fix whatever it is is happening. So I am not completing a lap on my second lap out. I'm already pissed off. I'm already scared. I've already almost wrecked the car twice. So I get in line again, and this is my third lap out at Road Atlanta. In the rain, in a car that won't turn. Horrible lap, multiple straightens, but I actually completed it. Like, technically completed it because I didn't spin out at one point or another, but it was a ugly run. On top of that, it seems like the steering is getting worse. I now have like two degrees of steering angle before it starts to bind, lock, whatever the fuck it's doing. And I am getting so frustrated at this point. I'm like almost in tears. Like I cannot make this car turn. Fuck. This is the most frustrated I think I've ever been in my entire life. I didn't know what to do. I had nobody that could tell me what to do. Like... I was now in this predicament where I was a professional driver that couldn't drive a car that we built. So fourth lap up in my $500 paid practice day, I get to the line, somebody goes into the kitty litter, and every time somebody goes into the kitty litter, it's like 25 minutes to get the tow truck out there to take their bumpers off, to tow them out, to get them up onto the tow truck, to get them back off the course, etc., etc., etc. So I'm sitting here and idling, getting more and more and more and more soaking wet, and they're just about to clear the course and give us the all okay, and car dies. Go to start it, click, 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 dead battery. Oh my fucking God. Are you kidding me right now? I look in my rear view mirror, Aoki's back there vaping, like we got, we got nothing we can do to get this car, so we push it out. We sit it on the side, I watch a couple of runs, the tow truck comes, they bring me back into the pits, and I'm just like, this is so useless. Like, why am I even here at this point? So we jump it, we get a voltmeter on the alternator and it's only putting out eight volts. Okay, lost an alternator, no big deal. It's an old part from a 30 year old car and it's dead. So luckily I had a spare RB25 alternator from my old motor that we put in. And we turn the car on, we test the voltage, eight volts. My spare alternator was bad. <laughs> Can this get any better at this point? Paid practice is over. We are at a crossroads as to what the shit we need to do next. I have just paid way more than I ever wanted to for three laps basically of practice. And I didn't have a way to keep the, char the car charged other than putting multiple batteries in it. So we got on the internet, we looked around and we decided that a Quest alternator would be the best way to go. Apparently it has the same plug, but it needs a different type of bracket. So we headed to Home Depot. So we ordered the alternator from AutoZone, but it wouldn't be in until the next day. That's fine, whatever, it's raining, we're miserable. We just wanna be done with it, go eat something, go to sleep and cry ourselves into the pillow. So that's exactly what we did. We got the hardware we needed to make the joint for the tensioner for the new alternator. We ordered it from AutoZone. We were gonna pick it up first thing in the morning and slap that thing in, hopefully get a couple of laps of practice in, maybe look at the steering as much as we could and call it an evening. And that is where I'm going to end this video. I had no idea that Atlanta was gonna turn into a three-part video but there was a lot that went on kind of in between and drama and stupid shit. And that is exactly, and that is going to lead me into one of the only moments as a human being in my 40 years of existence now that I have even come close to having like a mental breakdown. And that would be the next day during qualification 
and man, that's going to be a heartbreaker. I, uh, I thank you guys again for watching this. It is Christmas Eve tomorrow, and I hope everybody has a wonderful Christmas. I hope you have a wonderful new year. Again, I'm going to release two more of these videos while I'm out here in the Czech Republic. I'm actually going to write and film them probably today um, just so I can get everything done and have the next two videos ready to go. So we'll have hopefully two before the new year. We'll see. Uh, this has been Officer Dan with Scotch and a Beer. Thank you guys very much for watching and I'll catch you on the flip side. Peace.